Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, hello everyone and uh, thanks for coming um, to hear hopefully a very interesting talk of Matthew Parkinson. Um, I'm Wolfram Schulte, I'm his host and uh, uh, our relationship goes actually uh, back uh, quite some time. Um, I was uh, recent, no, I was uh, in, in former times working with people in our Microsoft uh, Cambridge labs on uh, extending uh, C Sharp <laughs> for um, uh, object queries, and that was probably 2002, 2003, where I met uh, Gavin Biermann, and Matthew was Gavin's uh, student working on separation logic. At that time, Gavin wanted to convince me that separation logic is the, the future for verification, and I was very suspicious. Um, but now we have invited uh, Matthew to tell us uh, actually what the advancements has been, and they are quite impressive. And so I look forward to a nice talk on a marriage of free lie guarantee and separation logic. Thanks, Matthew, for coming. Okay, thank you, Wolfram. So this is joint work with a PhD student at Cambridge who's now at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, Victor Vafiedis. Um, and if you go to his web page, his thesis contains lots and lots and lots of details. And it's a very good read, so you should read it. Um, so what's the motivation? Um, concurrence is hard. So I, I like this quote I found in one of the Java Sun tutorials. If you can get away with it, avoid using threads. Threads can be difficult to use and they make programs harder to debug. So, and this was in the Threads and Swing tutorial from 1999 from Java, which is pretty good sort of emphasis on using threads, don't. The tutorial on using threads says, don't do it. Um, so obviously, people are being told not to use concurrency. But there's this new message that multi-cores everywhere. Basically, we, there's two cores in this machine. I'm sure maybe some people have got four cores in their machine already, or eight, or 12, or I think by 2011, Intel are predicting 80 cores or something. So this means concurrency is going to be everywhere. So we can't just sort of sit down and tell people not to do concurrency. So the best kind of things we can hope for is to have very clever libraries where we verify them, and then people use that and don't do any concurrency themselves, they just use clever libraries. So inside these libraries, we might want lovely dynamically allocated data structures. So they're going to kind of add bit, sort of bits of heap. Um, and we want to really reason about these in a modular way. So we don't want our sort of verification to kind of explode by considering all possible interleavings of all possible client programs. So we want to be very tractable about this. So let's think about a nice little library. So we could have a coarse grain uh, locking linked list. So by coarse grained, I mean we're going to take one big lock, do something to the list, and then release our big lock. So this is great. Um, sorry, I'll go back. This is great, apart from it's very inefficient, because only one person can use a list at a time. So the sort of textbook thing, the second year computer science at Cambridge learn about how to do this better, is to do some little bits of fine grain locking. So rather than taking one big lock, we'll take lots of little locks. So we'll grab a lock on the top bit, and then we'll grab a lock on the next bit. And then we'll release the first lock, and we'll grab the second. Release the second, and grab the fourth. Release the third and grab the fifth. Oops. Oh, Victor changed the slides. Sorry. So what we're doing is we're just, now we can have several people going down the list at the same time because each one will just hold their lock and they'll traverse down. Now this is kind of nice, it adds to concurrency, but it makes our life a bit harder to think about. Then you kind of go and you read sort of the Podsy world and you sort of see these optimistic traversal algorithms where someone will optimistically bounce down the list get to node 7, and they'll lock it. And then they'll optimistically go down the list again and see if it's still there. And if it is, then it was locked. And if it isn't, it wasn't locked. It just really confuses me, um, these optimistic things, but Victor understands them. Um, so there's uh, another sort of algorithm where you can delete things in several steps. So you can lock it, but you can only lock it if it isn't in the process of being deleted. 
and it all gets very confusing. But it's great. It, it makes it faster, I'm told. Um, but the problem with this kind of optimistic algorithm is you can't actually dispose the memory easily because you don't know when someone's looking at something. With a hand-over-hand -hand locking list, you know when someone's looking at it because they've locked it. With this, someone can be looking at it and there's no kind of visible state to saying that they're looking at it unless you inspect their stack. So that's what you have to do. You have to garbage collect and inspect their stack to see if they're looking at it. So what kind of things are actually happening in these algorithms? So with the lock, uh, the pessimistic hand-over-hand -hand locking, really there's four sort of operations. Uh, is there a pointy thing? Just a pointy thing? No. <laughs> Thank you. So here's a pointy thing. <laughs> Electronic pointy thing. Ooh, bright green. OK, so we can lock a node. So if it's unlocked, we can make it locked. And if we've locked a node, then we can unlock it. And if we've locked a node and we know kind of where it's looking, then we can swing its point around and stick in a new node. And if we want to delete a node, if we lock it, its predecessor and it, then we can remove it. So it's just kind of little pictorial representation of the algorithm, what's going on, how we can kind of see what people can do. Um, so for the optimistic version, it's all pretty much the same, but when we remove the node, we just leave it there. We don't kind of get rid of it. So here, it just kind of disappears. It's no longer there. We don't care. It's gone. But here, we have to leave it there because other people could be looking at it at the moment. So this is kind of pretty simple textbook algorithms. Um, I think I have second-year students who understand it. So we've had this long history of verification. So it started back in the 70s, or maybe even late 60s with Hoare, doing verification. And then we got the sort of a wiki grease and a, a temporal logic. And then sort of in the 80s, you got rely guarantee. And then more recently, you've got this wonderful thing called separation logic. Um, and then sort of O'Hearn's extension to do concurrency with it, which came out in 2004. So you'd think sort of this 30 years of verification we could reason nicely about that algorithm. Unfortunately, we can't. So with none of these, there's really, there doesn't seem to be a tractable way of actually verifying that code. So what I'm going to talk about today, as the title might have suggested, is a, a combination of the latter two. So a marriage of rely guarantee and separation logic, as Peter called it. I mean, you can reason about anything. You, can just, you have to write an appropriate invariant Program. OK, okay but in, in a modular way, so one that's extensible to... So you, you basically you mean that you don't want to write an invariant that talks about the PCs of two different threads and things like that? Okay. I I just, yeah, I want something that when I d verify my algorithm once, it's verified, and then no matter what context or what happens around it, it's going to work correctly. And I don't... Well, may, with rely guarantee, it, it's almost... There, but it's really messy. And with separation logic, it was kind of almost there, but really messy. Um, and yeah, if you encode everything into lots and lots and lots of auxiliary state, then yes, you've got a completeness proof, so you can do it. But should you want to? Um, I had a paper at Popolo 7 where I verified a non-blocking stack with just concurrent separation logic. And trust me, I'm not going there again. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. So let's go through the two logics we're going to build on briefly. So we've got rely guarantee. So what's the idea with rely guarantee? So we've got threads interacting. So we want to abstract their interactions. So we have a rely, which is kind of a relationship on what the world around us is going to do, what the environment's going to do. And we've got a guarantee which says, we're going to do no worse than this. We're not going to inflict any more pain on you than what our guarantee says. So then when we verify bits of code, we sort of talk about a precondition and a postcondition, as you get with whole logic, but also you get a rely and a guarantee, which say how the environment and how we are interacting with the environment. So then, yeah, we have to say that everything we do in here is in here. And this is all kind of tidy. So this is very compositional. Uh, picture of Cliff Jones, if, no one, if you don't know what he looks like. Um, he was... His thesis was on rely guarantee. Um, 
So if we want to stick two threads in parallel, C1, C2, we can just take, um, so the conjunction of our preconditions and the conjunction of our postconditions, and it's the union of the things they say they're going to do. And then we've got this kind of outside world R, which is what the environment's going to do. So when we verify C1, we have to consider the outside world and the parallel process, C2, which is guaranteeing to do no more than G2. And uh, when we verify C2, we do R and G1, which is what the other process guarantees to do no more than. Um, so we're only doing safety here, so don't worry, this, the cyclicity doesn't matter for anyone who's a model checker. What type do variables R, G1, G2 have? Um, there are relations state to, so there are relations over states, so they're power set, subsets of a power set of state cross state. So don't you want R and R intersection G2 and R intersection G1 there? No, because, because R is what the world around us is going to do. So if the world around us does nothing, then we still have to worry about what the yeah. parallel threads do. Okay, so this kind of eliminate some of the issues with the Awiki Grease style logic because we don't have to consider all possible interleavings. We've just got an abstraction on what the interleavings are. But as Cliff said in one of his papers, is a more compositional approach possible? Because it doesn't kind of... Well, if you've got heap structures, it just is as sort of difficult as ever. Um, but it's quite nice for the concurrency aspects. So, uh, 20 years later, Peter O'Hearn comes along and does separation logic. So in separation logic, we get this kind of idea of local reasoning where we just talk about what it is we're going to change, how it is sort of the bits of state that we change and not everything else. And this leads to this kind of, well, we get this separating conjunction which says that we can split the state into two pieces. So here we've got a state that satisfies P star R, which means we can pull it apart. So one bit satisfies P and one bit satisfies R. So then if we know that a command will take some state looking like P to Q, then we also know that it will take some state satisfying P star R to Q star R because we can just make it bigger. And we know that we've... So the way separation logic works, this is considered tight. So everything it's going to touch will be mentioned in P. So anything separate from it won't be touched. Um, but when Peter did his concurrent separation logic work, he kind of did the simplest thing and went back to the 70s and took Hoare's original rules for concurrency. And at the end of his paper, he did ask, is a marriage between rely guarantee and separation logic possible? Um, so for those of you who don't want to listen anymore, the answer is yes. Um, uh, by Hoare's original rules, you mean his rules uh, for reasoning about monitors? Yeah. Yes. But is, it, is that true? Uh, for the concurrent conditional critical regions in the t uh, towards the theory of practical parallel programs or something, I think. So but isn't it true that in concurrent separation logic, uh, basically this, uh, this thing becomes more dynamic in Hoare's original rules? The yeah. So it's a generalization, right? So it's a generalization. It, um, I think Steve Brooks calls this the ohernification of a rule, which is where you take the ands and you replace them with stars. So he took the parallel composition rule and the invariant critical region rules and replaced the ands with stars. So... Um, yeah, so it, it's a generalization in that it deals with heap, but it kind of still has the same way of dealing with interference, which is through invariance, rather than with rely guarantee, where it deals with abstractions of how interactions occur. Um, so yeah, so Pete asked if this was possible, and the rest of the talk is going to show how it is. Uh, so how am I doing time? Cool. Okay, so concepts. So I'm going to do go through everything we need informally, and then I'll pull it together in a formal section which you can listen to or not, but you should listen to the informal section because you get all the information from that. So the idea is we've got these actions. So those pictures I drew earlier were quite um, intuitive but also intentional because this is how I'm going to present everything. So what we want to do is describe how programs interfere. So here is um, an unlocked node going to a locked node. So we're just saying what the state the environment can do. And then similarly we've got an unlocked node going to a locked and I could have redrawn all four of the things I had on that earlier slide. So we're just describing the kind of relational interference. What can change? We're not saying what's true, we're just saying what can change. So what, what do you mean by we describe? We're describing. 
do we write a specification? We, we give, we give, give um, yeah, we have a specification of a rely and a guarantee. So when we want to verify something, we have to give precondition, postcondition, rely and guarantee. Um, or depending on how much automation we have, less. But for now, I think that Victor will tell you ways of inter inferring lots more. Uh, I like it just to be there and then Victor infer it. So this is kind of one of the things we have to specify how the algorithm interacts. But this feels quite a natural little way of specifying how a lock coupling list works. Um, so for those of you not familiar with the frame rule, really, so here it is again. So what we're saying with it is that we can kind of extend state. Um, so if we specify something as taking P to Q, then we can put anything around it in. So if here we were going to do this unlock action, this thing's getting a bit... Doing this unlock action, which takes this P, which is a locked node, to an unlocked node, well, we could take away the rest of the stuff around our lock node 5, and then we can do this little action that changes it to unlocked, and then we put the rest of the world back. So what we're saying here, when we take these actions, we're kind of taking them as closed under extensions of the world with stuff we don't change. So this gives us a kind of... So rather than just this action saying, if we had a single node, we could change it to a single node that was unlocked, it's saying, if we have a list with a locked node in it, we can unlock it. It's, so this is kind of coming from the local reasoning from separation logic. So now, if we actually had some bit of heap that looked like a list, and we'd lock nodes 5 and 7 here, or nodes containing 5 and 7, and we, we're, we're going to be thread A, let's say. So what can happen to this state? So if we were trying to sort of see what was going on around us, well, someone could come and add something at the end, or someone could take something away at the beginning. Oh. Thanks. Yep. And get through these at an amazing rate. I think I've just got kind of absorbing staticness from them. But, ooh, bright. OK, so nodes can kind of appear and disappear. So what is it that's actually going to remain true? We kind of, we've got this interference and this sort of things are happening, but what stays the same? Well, we can kind of view an abstract view of the list, which is there is some piece of list with locked nodes and then some piece of list. And this is going to kind of stay the same no matter what the world around us does. So how do we actually justify that? Well, let's say that the environment is called B and we're called A. So we've locked threads 5 and 7 with A. And we want to kind of fire all of these actions against this state and see if it changes. So this can match only against bits in here or here. So in the two ends of the list, but it can't match our nodes that we've locked because this is asking for an unlocked node. So this means that the only thing that can happen is we change this bit of list but we didn't really care what was in it. And similarly for this unlocked, there could be a locked B node in here and it could change to another one, but it's still just going to preserve its listness. And we don't care about anything else. Um, if we come along and we add some nodes, again it can only match in here or in here because this nodes we, we've locked. So these actions just aren't going to affect this property. So what we can say is this, this property is stable under the interference of the environment. So we've kind of taken a symbolic state that isn't going to change. As, so these are the kind of assertions we want to write. Because if we write this, then it doesn't change until we do something. No matter what the environment does, as long as it satisfies the rely, then this will be true. So we can be delayed arbitrarily, and this will stay the same. So this is kind of one of the key things from rely guarantee, this sort of stability of assertions, this, that what we say is true no matter what the environment does. So one of the things that we kind of add when we go to the separation logic world is, well, where does this bit of state come from? Because before we had two nodes, and afterwards we've got three nodes. So this kind of just appeared. So if this is supposed to be kind of a little atomic step of the environment or ourselves, what this atomic step says is we're going to call malloc, swing this pointer, assign to its tail this thing, and that's all atomic. I, well, I don't know what 
kind of atomic you have on your machine, but I'm pretty sure mine doesn't do that atomically. And similarly here, when we do delete, we kind of get rid of this node and swing this pointer. So how can we do this in just a single step? Well, the reason we can do this in a single step is that it's not happening all in one go. Really, the kind of key concept here is that there's shared state and there's local state. So there's the stuff that we're worried about with respect to this linked list, which everyone's hammering on and trying to fiddle with. And then there's the local state, which is what we have in our hands that we've allocated and no one else knows about. So we've got this sort of distinction between the two. Now, this distinction is going to be dynamic because this line will animatedly move. But well, it won't be very animated. I didn't get around to changing that one since getting Keynote 3 or 4, whatever it is. But the idea is we've got this state here, which is a shared state, with this node locked. And we want to add 6 into this list of primes. We're not very good at primes, obviously. Um, so what's going to happen is we've got a pattern that looks like this. So we've got a lock node and another node. And we're just going to swing this pointer around. And it's now in the list. So we've dynamically allocate, sort of pushed it into the shared state. It wasn't allocated at that point, but it, we've just made it into the shared state. So now it's accessible. And all we had to do is this little pointer swing, which I hope is atomic on most machines. Um, so what we can do, other operations we can do, so we can look at this node that's unlocked, and we can say lock it. And now we could just undo what we've done, because we've locked this node. So now we might want to remove it from the list. So again, here we're not going to dispose of it directly. We're just going to swing this pointer around. And by swinging this pointer, we've kind of made this thing local to us now. And because this is local to us, we can do nice things like dispose. So we've not lost any memory in this list algorithm when we do it with hand over hand locking. Because when we lock it, it kind of we can then actually get rid of it from a list. So this is quite nice, I think. And this is one of the things that none of the previous approaches could really do tidily. Um, so how do you know that it was local? I mean, there, could, there could be another pointer to it. I'm, I'm going to go, go backwards, backwards from my slide, slide and hope this works. But, uh, shite. So that's OK. So this delete action has three things on the left. I can use this, can't I? I stand back. has three bits on the left and two bits on the right. Now, I've, I've been a bit slack because I haven't labeled each of these with different numbers. But trust me that this one's this one and this one's this one. So on the right-hand side, it doesn't exist anymore. So it can't be shared, because this says what happens to the shared state. So if it goes from being shared to not being shared, the only place it can go is into my local state. So kind of the way this, the relations are set up, they say what happens to the shared state. And anything that doesn't appear here on this side in the shared state must be local. It's the only way we could redraw this diagram with that pointer swing such that it satisfied this relation. Sounds like there's more to that. It means that in your pattern at the lower left, <coughs> the arrow means this is the sole pointer in the entire diagram to this node, rather than this is one arrow to this node out of other. No, it, all it's saying is if there's part of the heap that looks like this, part of the shared heap, then we can change it to part of the shared heap that looks like this. So someone else might have a pointer to the bottom thing that yeah. you're deleting. Yeah, that's fine. fine. They won't access it because they need to have permission to access it. So this is one of the things that's a bit different with separation logic. To access memory, you need to know it's there and allocated. And if you had a pointer to a bit of a list that you hadn't locked, then you're, when you do your stabilization, it'll disappear. You won't know it's still there necessarily. You'll, and you'll have to consider all possible disjunctions of what could happen. And in the majority of those, it won't be there. So you'd, you'd get a problem if you try to access it. So where is the lock? Is the lock embedded in the object that is linked? Yeah, so there's a, an additional field that's the lock field in this. So I'm just encoding everything into the shared state, and the locks are just bits. But in that case, if you're a prop, yeah. Yeah, so then, I mean, in that case, if, if supposing the, the, the thread that is deleting the node, yeah. It deletes the node and then frees it, right? Yeah. Let's say another thread has a pointer to it. Yeah. So what it can do is it can try to access the lock no. and then try to acquire the lock. 
to, to try and lock something, you have to know it's there. You have to know it's there. And, and the, the only, only way you can know something's in this list is if you've locked the node before it. Ah, I see. So the assumption is that the only way you get handles or pointers to the objects in the list is through this uh, delete method and the, and the add method. So, so these, the, these operations, the, the four operations I showed, um, to lock the node, you had to know it was in the list. Okay. You had to know it's in the shared state. And if you know it's in the shared state, the only way you can do that is if it's the head or if you've locked the node before it. It's kind of all implicit from the way the relations do stabilization. I, I have one more question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you're using a method to prove that all disposed operations are safe. Is yeah. there anything else you're proving? Um, so I'm not going to prove anything else. I think in the paper we prove that it remains sorted. Okay. Yeah. Um, Victor, in a more recent work, has sh proved linearizability as well on top of this, so okay. there's some kind of abstraction. But I haven't done any of that, and I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, invite Victor across. He works for Microsoft. You can just force him, can't you? Um, OK, so we can actually dispose this node, because the only way we can lock it is if we know it's definitely in the shared state. Um, so. If we're doing the optimistic algorithm, where we, so we've got to this state again with the two lock nodes. Now in the optimistic algorithm, we can lock anything we have a pointer to that we kind of knew was in the shared state. So here we have that kind of a problem about disposing. So when we actually do this operation, we leave it there because the optimistic people can look through the list without actually taking locks. So if, for them to be sound, we have to leave this in the state and we can't dispose of it. Um, OK, so this is kind of told you kind of the key ideas. So there's this stability and this kind of transfer of ownership between things. So what we need to also do is actually execute programs. So kind of do the proof. So I'm going to do this pictorially as well, because I've spent ages making these slides now over the last year. So everything's pictorial. So the idea is if we start out, so the kind of invariant we're going to have that we kind of just assume on entry is that there's a list from head. OK. So what we're going to do is point P to the head. And that's what's true here. And now we're going to lock P. Ooh. So we've locked the node at the top, and we've got head. And then we're going to take C to point to the tail. OK. So now we've got this part. So we're coming to a loop. So we're going to assume someone gives us a nice, tasty loop invariant, which is going to be that we have some bit of list, a lock node at P, and then C pointing to the tail. Um, we can infer this loop invariant, but I'm not going to go there today. So now you can all get ready to ooh and ah because the animation gets even better, trust me. So we're going to now verify this loop. So we start off with a loop invariant. So the pr when we've got this loop invariant, the first thing we do is lock C. So we lock C, and now we're going to unlock P. OK? So this is the state we have after unlock. Anyone see any problems with this state? Is this state true 10 seconds after we unlock it? Exactly. So now we stabilize. <laughs> So now this is the symbolic state we have. We, don't, we had a pointer to P, which was something in the list, but we don't know it's there anymore, so we just have to lose it. So, but now what we're going to do is we're going to set P equal to C and C equal to P. So what do you mean we are going to lose it? This is part of the operational semantics? No, no so, so this, this is, is part of the symbolic execution. So we do a stabilization step after every action that takes the interference from the world around us. So somebody has specified the rely condition, which you're not showing us. Which, which are those pretty, pretty pictures, pictures of lock, unlock, et cetera, is the rely guarantee condition, which I will show you how you translate those into separation logic and what they mean in a bit. But they're just, that's all there is in the state for relations. Uh, it comes up in like two slides if you're prepared to wait. <laughs> OK. I'm not sure how much of the stuff you're telling us is particular argument about this particular algorithm versus how much is part of the general framework of rely guarantee and separation logic. For instance, 
Is it tied to locks or does it also work with compare and swap? It works with compare and swap. So by locks here, I'm just assigning to one location in a shared state a thread identifier and then assigning zero in to unlock. So I don't have locks built in. I'm just assuming there are some operations I can do on the shared state that are atomic. And I, they're modeled in this world by assignments and compares and swaps or whatever you want at sort of uh, operational semantics. Um, this stability thing is kind of a general thing once you've got the relies and the guarantees set up. So you have to specify those and then, and then the pretty graphics happen by the tool automatically. The tool doesn't generate slides like this yet. I have to work out how to do that. Uh, so then we get to the end and we've pretty much got the same thing as our loop invariant as you can see. It's just actually the same when you draw the list of different lengths. Okay, so this is kind of an informal proof of uh, how you traverse the hand over hand locking list. So now I've got to. Oh. So I don't quite understand how or why you you proved the loop invariant. I could see the the nodes that you look at. You could you could reason about, but um, we'll go. Uh, um, you're not in control over that the, that the rest of it forms a list, and probably you don't care either. Well, well, if, if it, it forms a list at start, then it forms a list at end. Well, I don't know, whatever. It's if everyone else obeys a rely. Oh, I see. So your rely says that. Your rely says what the environment can do. I see. I was thinking that the environment could just party on, on that list. And no, so rely guarantee, guarantee is kind of about preventing people doing bad things. Okay, I, I forgot the... Can you show us your rely condition? What is the rely for this program? Uh... Let me. <laughs> it's this. Okay, so um, this is a separation logic assertion that says if x, so x points to something, which first bit is zero, and then some value and some tail, and then afterwards it changes to x points to some thread our thread identifier or the environments, depending on if you're seeing it as a rely position or a guarantee position. Um, and then this says that some lo node with some thread identifier and some value and tail can be unlocked. So again, so here we can only do it with our thread identifier. Uh, here we see that if we've got a node and we've locked it and it points to some tail t, which we don't care about, and afterwards we can change it to this formula which says that x points to t with some value and some y, and y point is unlocked and has some value prime and the original tail. Um, and then these things are closed under all extensions of the heap that doesn't change. So if you, um, this you can see there's a very little sort of bit of relation which we then close under extensions. Is that? So th these are actions? Yeah. Uh, so, so the rely is the transitive closure of the relation to these induce. Um, the guarantee is similarly the same with thread identifier replaced with your, either your thread identifier or the environment or the other thread identifiers. So the rely can't say that it's a list, it can only say if you gave us a list then we leave yeah. this to the end. Yes. In, In fact, fact this doesn't, doesn't say anywhere that it's a list. It just happens that if you start with a list and you apply these rules it will still be a list and if you start with a list and you've locked a node in it then it will still be a list and that node will remain locked. So these are just saying what the environment's doing to the world. Sure. So why do you have to use thread ID here? Why can't you just use a one or zero? Because rely guarantee isn't quite good enough. Um, no. Because if you switch to one and zero, you don't need a rely guarantee. If, if I switch to one and zero, I can't that do. Your work, right? Yes. But the specification wouldn't. The specification wouldn't work because this says that if there are two nodes next to each other locked, then I can remove one. It doesn't say, if we use thread identifiers, it says I've locked both of them. Now, what can actually happen if you just take the ones and zeros and the normal sort of symmetric rely guarantee world, it says, well, I've locked this node, and if I know the next node is locked for some bizarre reason, then I can remove it even if it was someone else. 
So there's a kind of a bit of a, a mismatch here with the way it works. And this is something that I'm working on at the moment with a postdoc about trying to make it so that it's symmetric and does the right thing. I think this is horrible having to use thread identifiers. I don't like it, but it was a step. Thread ID to enforce that in the shared heap, you can tell whether these two nodes are locked by the, the same thread. Yeah, which is a sledgehammer, but, but it no. I mean, even if there was just a single node, a single global node, yeah. you still need a thread ID because yeah. the lie guarantee needs that, otherwise you can't write the rely on the guarantee conditions. Yeah, but we can, so, so there's some tricks we can play with separation logic about to try and get away from it, but I haven't developed them yet enough. So one of the ideas is when we lock a node, so there's this thing called fractional permissions where you take away some part of the node. When, so when you lock it, you take away half of the node. And then that's kind of means that until someone, so only you can unlock it because you're the only one with the other half. And there's some tricks you can play like that, but we've not quite worked out the soundness of it at the moment. So. I have one more question. Uh, the way I understand uh, the rely and guarantee is that the rely condition has to be reflexive and transitive. Yes. Consider as a relation. I yeah. didn't see that anywhere in your story here. Okay, so the way we apply the stability check is that we take whatever our post condition is, apply this action, this set of actions once, and we have to imply what our post condition was. So that gives us the reflexivity and transitivity for free. Um, but you can equally happily, if you want to, we could just say we did, took the transitive reflexive closure. It just happens that the way I'm spelling it out makes it easier for us to build our tool. Um, so I'll just go back to over s some slides. Uh, so separation logic's kind of pretty, trust me. Um, and it has this star connective which says two things are separate. Um, and here I'm going to use another connective called septraction. Or is, for those of you familiar with separation logic, it's the De Morgan dual of magic wand. But that sounds far worse than septraction. So just say that it's nice and easy. Um, so the idea of this operator is that it's really like subtraction, but for separation logic. So what it's saying is if you've got p subtract q, then that's saying we can take away some bit of heap looking like, h, looking like p called h prime from the heap that looks like q, and that's what we're left over with. Um, it, don't worry about it too much if that's confusing, just ignore it. It's, 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 it's very useful for tools. Um, so this kind of is the sort of standard view of separation logic. But we want to extend the logic so we can talk about both shared states and local states, because we've got this shared state, which contains the list, say, and our local state, which contains the nodes we're fiddling with and about to dispose. So we, add, we sort of build a second layer of logic on top, where we distinguish between local states and shared states. So what, all we do is we take normal separation logic formulas and we put shared ones in a box. Um, the idea behind putting them in, so we could have a box local and a box shared, but it just happens that this is the syntactically shortest way to present proofs. So that's the one we took, took as default. Um, so, and we have a star at this level as well, and this has a more interesting meaning. So the idea, so kind of the world we're considering for a state is that there's a local state L and a shared state S. So if we've got some separation logic formula that isn't boxed, then we just interpret that on the local state. And if we've got one that is boxed, then we interpret it on the shared state. And if we've got P star, so two formulas starred at this logic, then what we do is we separate the local state. So each thread will get, so the local state gets split into two pieces, but the shared state gets shared. So the shared state gets split across the two assertions. And this is kind of really the, one of the most important bits of this, I think. Um, but we can kind of have this modality that allows us to share information between threads. So this kind of happens in concurrent separation logic under the hood with the way the invariants work. But because there is one and it's global, it's true all the time. We don't have to write it everywhere. So here, what, when we write things about the shared state, we want them in lots of places. Chris? No, kind of, no. 
So it, it, of the three rules for linear logic, it satisfies one. So in that sense, f vaguely. Uh, the first time we wrote the paper, we got lots of criticisms for not comparing it to uh, the exponential in linear logic. So then we wrote a very nice footnote saying, it's nothing like it, trust us, <laughs> and then said what it didn't satisfy. Uh, Um, well, okay, so we interpret the stars inside here as normal separation logic stars. So there's no kind of, this box we can't push in over stars, say, or something like that. We won't get those kind of properties because what, we've just got a two-layer logic. We can't, we can't do arbitrary boxing. We've just, so, um, so Zhang and Xiao's done a very similar work, and there they literally just have two formula. Um, rather than this kind of glue logic that we developed. Um, okay, so uh, did I say everything about this slide? Is everyone happy about this slide? So this is just converting pretty pictures to separation logic formula. Um, so when we actually, maybe I should have presented this earlier, this slide. Um, so when we actually want to verify a piece of code, we have some precondition, which might say the, the shared state contains a list. And then we have our relies and guarantees, which are these kind of relations that specify how we can change that shared state. And then our post condition will be whatever we can prove. So this could be we've still got a list. So these are the kind of assertions we make in our proof system. So You have to write a pre and post condition for every line of code, right? Um, well, if you don't want any automation, yes, but we've got, so the tool I'll talk about briefly at the end, uh, symbolically executes and calculates all the intermediates and does abstract interpretation to guess loop invariance. Uh, so then you just have to give a pre and it will calculate a post. So at, at that point, that's where you will take care of the reflexivity and the transitivity of the... Yeah. yeah. I see. Okay. And the pre and conditions are written over what? Shared state or local state? Both. Both. So, so it's, it's, this is in the kind of glue logic where we can write boxed assertions and non-boxed assertions. So all of the things I showed you in the execution were boxed assertions because I were just talking about the shared state and I didn't, it was only on the slide where I showed things transferring between them that we really had any unboxed assertions as well. So if you write it over the shared state, is there some restriction that you can write it only over stable properties or? Yeah, two slides. Um, so the parallel rule here is, uh, as Steve would call it, an ohernification of a, one of Cliff's rules, which again, we've got the same use of relies and guarantees in here. But instead of the and we had before, we've changed it to a star. So what this star is saying is, well, the star splits, share, sorry, splits local states and shares shared states. So each side will get the same view of the shared state, but will get their own local state with this star. And when we go all the way around here, we take these two things and we can join them by star, which says we'll take the intersection of their views of the shared state and we'll combine whatever they had in the local states. So this, kind of, this gives us the, the local reasoning that you get in separation logic, but it also allows us to make these assertions about shared state that you get from rely guarantee. Um, uh, well, it's formula are going to be interpreted as a set. Uh, con conjunction is just interpreted as this intersection of two sets. So there's a set of pairs of shared and local states. So we'll take all of the shared local pairs in here and here, search that they agree on the shared state, mm -hmm. and we'd star conjoined by local states if that's defined, and if that's not defined, it's... Given some new meaning to the star operator? Yeah, so that was... Yeah, so its, inter so its interpretation of the shared state is different. It's, in effect, classical conjunction for the shared state, but multiplicative sort of standard separating logic stuff for the local state. Okay. And the post condition, I allowed to refer to the original uh, state, that means I allowed to refer to P1 and P2. Well, so at the moment, we just have post conditions that are one state. Um, because there isn't a nice way of expressing two-state post conditions in separation logic, which 
doesn't just boil down to doing exactly the same thing as you would have done with logical variables in one state post condition world. So uh, that's kind of underlying separation logic weakness, I'd say. Um, OK, so the atomic rule. So we split it into two bits because it makes it easy to present. So the first bit is if we've got some atomic command C and we want to say that it satisfies uh, PQ with some rely R and some guarantee G, we stabilize the pre and the post, and then we check that what we're doing is actually going to be that. So a misstabilization here does the reflexive transitive closure of the actions. Uh, or the, well, actually, sorry, it, it just checks that P R implies P. And if that's true, then it was, that's the same as doing the tra transitive reflexive closure, because we're given P and Q. Um, so then if we want to do the atomic command for actually where we've got the empty rely, so we've dealt with the stability in this rule. So then what we've got left is we take our local state, P1, and some bit of the shared state, P2, and there's some other bit of shared state we don't care about, F. And what we're going to do is we're going to execute C on P1 conjoint starred with P2. So this is the standard star from separation logic. And then we'll get out some post condition Q1, Q2. And then we separate those up and put part of it in the shared state with whatever was left over. And the rest is local. So this rule here, because we've got a star here and here, and they don't have to split it in the same way, it can do this ownership transfer between the shared and the local state, as you saw in the add and the delete node rules. Um, this star f is because it's, we don't want the guarantee to have to say everything about the state. Do you only think that atomic is top line? Yes. Yes, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Tom, oh, sorry. That was Victor, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. F has no constraints on it. Yeah. It's just, there is some bit of, so, we could annotate this with a sort of action P2, Q2, saying this is an add, or this is a remove, or this is a lock, or something. And then all of these bits become very determinized, um, which is what the tool does. Um, but yeah, F is just the bit of state we're not touching. So this atomic C means that you're executing C atomically? Yeah. So, so we're we just assuming there are some commands we can write atomic around. Like on Intel architecture, you can write locked next to some instructions. Uh, we don't, so the idea is that by writing this explicitly, we haven't tied ourselves into a particular model of what's atomic. Sure. So we just want it as an annotation for saying, this proof only works if this command is executed atomically. OK, so then we have to do this stability check. So if we have some share state S, and we want to say that it's stable with respect to an action that takes a P to a Q, so this thing and this thing, say, then one thing we can do is this logical check, which says if we take S and we subtract a P from it, and then we star in a Q, if we've still got something in S, then we're stable with respect to that action. So really, if we just take away a bit that looks like P and put in a bit that looks like Q, and we've still got something that looks like what we started with, then it doesn't matter how many times we do that, because we're just going to carry on in the same place. Yeah? I still don't completely understand this P, funny arrow, Q business. So P is a formula in separation logic. Yeah. And so is Q. Yeah. So what you really want is a relation. Well, well I, I don't, don't want a relation, because they're harder to work with. In. So what does this mean? What is the semantics of this? The it's semantics not... of this is a relation. The, re the semantics of this are for any state satisfying P and any state satisfying Q, take um, the re that as an element of a relation. I see. So from and then, state in P, you can go to any state in Q. And, and then, then you can add in any bit of disjoint state that won't change, so that doesn't change. So it's. Uh, so if we had. Um, H, satisfi H1 satisfies P and H2 satisfies Q, then we've got H1 star H3, H1 star 
sorry, H2 star H3 is the relation that induces. So, at least in classical logic, not every relation R over two variables X and Y can be expressed as a conjunction of two other relations, say Px and Qy, right? So this is not very general, right? Because you are you are giving the precondition separately and the postcondition separately, right? Yeah. For example, let's say that there's a variable. So let's say I want well, to say, we, so, so we, we quantify, quantify across, across. So there's actually an interpretation of variables that's shared between the two sides, which I think then gets you back to. So let me ask my question very concretely. Let's say that there's a shared variable x, an integer, yeah. and I want to write a rely condition that the environment can only increase x. Yeah. Right? How am I going to write that? So, okay, so there's, there's logical variables that are shared between the two sites. So, actually, uh, this is for some interpretation, but it's shared across the two sides where that talks about variables. So, these are logical variables. So, I'd say, so you could say x points to i goes to x points to j and j is bigger than or equal to i, where x and j are logical variables. So they're kind of quantified out here as, but that's all kind of implicit in, so this is a kind of, one of the sort of implicit tricks that's often done with whole logics. So, which is perhaps why I'm confusing you. Um, okay, okay, go ahead. Uh, OK, so we can do this little sort of encoding of how things are stabilized. Uh, so Cristiano Calcagno and Victor and myself uh, used this as a basis for tool support. So we have a tool called Smorfotar G, which you can get off Victor's web page, um, which verifies the lock coupling list, optimistic list. It does Peterson's algorithm for mutual exclusion, but it's a bit overkill really because that would be better to model check because it's not got very many states um, and Simpson's four slot algorithm we can do as well and was there some there's some stack ones that we can do as well and a queue I think now so in, the, in the optimistic version you said that you can't actually do reclaim memory right yeah you never actually form the the, the free operation yeah you form the free operation so then what did you verify in that one um just that you don't go indirect through null, and you don't. You never dereference null. And I think, yeah, I think that was. I don't think. So Victor proved linearizability in more recent stuff on that as well. But in this, what you are describing only proved the absence of null dereference. I, I think, think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, how many how many threads do are involved in each example? As, as many as you want. want, but it's it's modular in terms of the number of threads. It's rely guarantee doesn't have this. Thread ID, which is yeah, which, which is, is any, so for you is some value that is non-zero and for the environment is any value that is non-zero and isn't yours. Okay. So it doesn't, there's no bounding on this. It's all for as many threads as you want and as long a list as you want or whatever else there is in there. Peterson's is quite bounded still. But, um, okay. So when we do kind of symbolic execution, so we annotate our little atomic blocks with what the action is that they do. So, um, so what does this do? So if we've got some precondition that's a P1 and a P2 in the shared state, then we find the bit that looks like our start of the action, P2 prime, and then that gives us whatever was left over and we've still got our P1. So then we symbolically execute P1 and P2 prime to get some post condition X. So the red bits are the bits that the algorithms, standard algorithms just find for us. Um, so then we've got this X and we've got Q2 prime is known. So that we can use that to calculate what Q1 is. Sorry. For now this green bit's being calculated. And then stabilizing Q2 prime and F gives us some new state that's uh, stable with respect to the transitive closure of those relations, which then gives us our post condition. Uh, sir, yes? I remember in the previous rule, uh, you check on G. This one does not, right? 
Um, because we've had to... So by construction, if this symbolic execution succeeds, it would have been missed action. So you have to annotate each atomic command with which part of the guarantee they satisfy. So this one, by, if we can take the post condition we calculate and find Q2 prime in it, then it would satisfy that guarantee by construction. Um, actually, if you, you don't mind, can you show previous rule? Because that G was not clear what it is, right? Yeah. So here we don't, so this, in the kind of hand proof logic, we do arbitrary things here that you want. You just have to find that it's in the, in the guarantee. But when we do the proofs in the tool, we actually as, and then we specify the name of an action. And then that action is mapped to some pair of states. So, so two formula. Yeah, it's considerably more restricted because it, yeah, but it, it goes through fast and these proofs are really tedious to do by hand. So, I, yes, it's more restricted, but it seems okay in practice because it normally is the way you set up the actions. They do correspond to different bits of programs. So, um, so is, is, you're always assuming that in this case as well that P2 is stable already, right? Yes, so we have. Yeah, so we have four versions of the logic in Victor's thesis, one of which assumes nothing's stable, one of which assumes the input state is stable, one of which assumes the output state is stable, and one of which doesn't assume quite either is stable. But every time you do a semicolon, you have to stabilize stuff. So there's kind of different places you can put it. Um, I prefer this one which is why this is what got implemented. But I'm not sure which is best. Well, the one where nothing's stable, I think, is the worst. But, but this works quite nicely for forward symbolic execution. Um, so if we actually want to do this, we also have to calculate, say, loop invariants, otherwise we have to write them. And for things like optimistic lists, these are actually quite messy. Uh, so what we can do is kind of approximate. So if we've got some start state S0 for what we think the post condition is, we can keep applying our action of interference, actually the set of actions of interference, and take the disjunction of all of those, and that gets us a new approximation. And then we can apply standard sort of abstract interpretation for separation logic to it. So. Even if the original program did not have loops, what's going to end up happening is that oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, we'll insert a loop that yeah. repeatedly does the rely action. Right? OK, yeah. Happen, right? Sorry, yeah, I, I, I'm wrong. You're right. Um, after every atomic, when we do stabilization, we have to do these abstraction steps in this inductive process. Okay. Otherwise, we'd have to write post conditions everywhere. And that was boring. So we did the abstract interpretation. So yes, every post condition involves abstract interpretation. And you have to check the guarantee also, right? The, the, guarantees, the, the guarantees taken before stabilization. Right. So. Uh, have you shown how you check the guarantee? Yes, so, because, so we've said here that the action from the environment we're doing is P2 to Q2, which is one of the... Th so we, we set up an environment which maps actions to these things. And then that is checked here because, firstly, we, uh, taking the start state, we find P2 prime. And then we symbolically execute this state to X, which, and then we ask we query where Q2 prime is. And that tells us if, symbolic, if this inference succeeds, then we did that guarantee action. Okay. And remember, Q1 is what's left over, so that must be local. Uh, OK. Uh, quick comparison. So Zhang Xiao and his student, Zin, Xinyu? Yeah. Xinyu Feng and another person, I can't remember his first name, um, did a very similar thing at almost identical time. So they beat us to publication slightly. Um, so they took this kind of same idea of combining rely guarantee and separation logic. Um, so superficially, they look very different because they did it at assembly language and we did it at 
the sort of standard separation logic language. Um, but the kind of most of the ideas are quite similar. Um, so one difference. So that every command in their world is considered to access the global state, whereas in ours we just have to we annotate which ones need to be atomic to access the global state. Um, and we build auto, we built automation for ours with small foot RG to sort of do these proofs quickly. And whereas they've got, uh, I guess, lots of cock tactics or some cock tactics or lots of cock tactics to go through and do their proofs. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things which, when you first see the paper they did, I was horrified that they'd got exactly the same thing. But it's kind of reassuring that it's a good idea. Um, OK, so to summarize, because I'm over time, sorry. Uh, so we distinguish between local and shared state. Uh, we have actions that describe the updates on the shared state. And this, using separation logic, we get ownership transfer between the shared and local. And then we get a simple stability check. So kind of I see concurrency is really about two things. One is kind of partitioning state, and one is about dealing with interference. And separation logic is very good at doing this kind of partitioning of state, seeing sort of partitioning bits up, saying who's got which bits. And rely guarantee is a nice way of expressing interference between threads. So I kind of see this really as a, a good marriage of two logics. <laughs> Probably take two more questions and then I would say is um, uh, Matthew is here for three more weeks, so you can take it out and uh, discuss your problems. So maybe two more questions and then. We'll... So um, after we worked on this, of course we will, you know, try to look for examples to showcase our logic. We really have a hard time to find a good examples. So. Even for the uh, log coupling example, I'm not sure whether you really need to use rely guarantee. In other words, uh, in all the work we did on verifying thread and uh, uh, later on all those other examples, we find uh, uh, seems like we just need a uh, you know, very simple rely guarantee, one that does not rely on thread ID, but rather it's just uh, the uh, an invariant about the rest of the shared state. So the all both I and G will merely say uh, the start state satisfy an invariant and the end state satisfy an invariant. Okay, okay, but for the lock coupling list, internally you need to know things like any lock node will remain in the list. Right. So I, I agree okay. that on the outside you might not need it, but for actually doing the verification yeah, of a module. Maybe, maybe you can just, uh, you know, like in this particular case, you can implement, uh, you know, a lock that, uh, well, you can use some way to denote that uh, a particular state means the next uh, node is already locked. Rather than so, using thread ID, just uh, for the sake of, you know, introducing thread ID to argue that the next two has to be same. Yes. I, I guess my question is, do you find any real convincing example well, that you really need to use these, uh, you know, the relation, arbitrary relation A and G? Because even in your decision procedure, you also also say that, you know, in most cases, it's just P prime, this funny arrow Q prime, you know? Yes, so, well, if those little actions, I think, are important. Um, the example I presented at Popol 07 with this non-locking stack using, which actually disposed memory, uh, so it used the Magid Michael's hazard pointer thing. That, the proof there where you just use invariance is close to intractable. Uh, I understand it after about an hour of rereading the paper, so I'm not sure quite how anyone actually accepted it because it's so complicated. Um, but when I do the, I've redone the proof with the rely guarantee stuff, and it's actually quite clear. And I think it's, so I spent a year arguing with Richard Borner on a whiteboard about why this algorithm worked. Uh, it was a very good postdoc. So there is um, a rely guarantee version of your popo 07 proofs? Um, yes, but it's not typed up nicely. Okay. Okay. But
But the argument that we went through, Richard and I, when we came up with a proof, is very close to what we actually what you'd write down in the rely guarantee world. It's just then when we encoded it into invariants, that argument got lost in the encoding. So I think personally, I think these relies and guarantees are a natural way of expressing how these things are interacting and what stays the same, rather than invariants, which kind of force you into coming up with one thing that's true everywhere. So right. Did you end up using? Uh, could you have done the proof of the non-blocking stack using just rely guarantee, or do you need some of what, some of that separation logic as well? Also. Um, so. So again, the rely guarantee on its own, you can do all these proofs, but you end up encoding lots of information about when, you, when it's okay to dispose things. So you end up having a, an, a complete auxiliary heap of whether this bit of location is actually allocated or not, and whether it's sort of shared or not. And those things... The separation logic is really dealing with the heap. It has yeah. very little to do with concurrency. And concurrency is handled by this rely guarantee process. Yeah. You, you said that the property that you proved, uh, other than that you don't dereference at all, is that the, the list remains sorted. Is that right? That was the property that you proved, right? That was, yeah, yeah. in the concur paper, yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you specify that? Do you quantify overall the node somehow? Um, we, so in the recursive definition of what it meant to be a list segment, we had a recursive definition of what it meant to be a sorted list segment, which had additional parameters which were min and max for what was in the... So the the highest and lowest thing in that stretch of list. Min and max, it seems like, um, yeah, you need, you need both. You actually just need one, right, for the... Um, right, so no, I think you need both for, the, for it to be a list segment. If it was a list, you could just have one. But because you want to kind of break off and know that everything in that stretch is less than this, but because you want to be able to append at both ends. So that's why you need min and max. Thanks a lot, everyone.